I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hey everybody, I'm still a little bit of hungover from the last podcast, so I'm drinking some tea right now, so I need to get that got done. Don't kids, don't do that at home. Oh God, this is if you're, this, if you're still hungover just from the last podcast since it's been like what a week? A week? Yeah, you got problems. Man. It, it's it was just wicked, man. It was just you missed it, man. Even somebody in the comments said, "Too bad Matt, Matt missed out on this," because man. It was just, whew. Um, Everyone it, acknowledges the anima. Everybody does. And, uh, and I was happy to have missed the crazy shenanigans. Oh, <laughs> boy. Yes. And it's sort of. Sort of. This is Cinema Royal, folks, where we keep it classy most of the time. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and let me introduce to you guys the brother slash sisterhood of cinema here. First up, as always, is James Sullivan, also known as Hyretude. Tonight's broadcast is uh, brought to you by by Pink Vomit, followed by waking up the next morning and finding out that your uh, that your piss smells like red velvet. What the fuck? <laughs> That's probably your most obscure, gross tonight's broadcast ever. What'd you eat? Wait, what? Wait, who? You? First of all, why? You... Was it from? Okay. Was it from the Oreos? It was oh, from the God. Oreos. Oh my God! I woke up the next day. My my red, the red velvet. I was smelling it in my pee. <laughs> That's how bad it was. Oh my god, because he had red velvet Oreos and cinnamon bun Oreos for his, like, snack during the Drunk Royale. Oh my god. <laughs> That's horrible. And now your 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 minds have been warped. Oh, wow. Get- now that's You're something welcome. I know that's only in America. Considering in Canada, we don't get all those varieties of Oreos. Yeah, because apparently <laughs> we are desperate for red velvet. We love red velvet. We no, love no, it. the pancakes. Flavor outside of regular and golden. Oh. Oh wow! You can it. Damn. Can, Canada's missing out on all the Oreos. Ah. Yeah, damn it! But I love Oreos. Damn it! And, and then also have that variety of like, uh, stuff of like, uh, what was it like stuffing or. Like, triple, like layers. Like, the most that we got is maybe double layer, but then you got, like, triple layer and quadruple layer and stuff like that. Oh, my God. T- quadruple layer would probably be my shit, because I love the cream. Double stuffed Oreos are amazing. <laughs> well, I know there's triple stuff. I know. Oh, guys. Somebody please send them a whole package of Oreos, all the varieties. Send them to the P.O. box. <laughs> <laughs> What's in the box? Oreo no, edition. Oreos. <laughs> hey, I got oh, red velvet. I got cinnamon butter Oreos. Holy crap, guys. Thank you. For all you the... like a fucking, what, you expect, like, in the next what's in the box, I'll just get a giant box and it's going to be nothing but <laughs> freaking Oreos. All the varieties of oh, Oreos. My yes. Oh, my God. I, can't... <laughs> I would so watch that and go, Oreos? What's this flavor? What's this flavor? It's not what's in the box anymore. It's what flavor Oreo is this? Yeah, it's like, what, this flavor? what the fridge is this? What the fridge is what this, the guys? Is this? <laughs> what the flock of sheep is this? Of all those are, although I wouldn't mind, actually, because a lot of them have interesting flavors. I know. That'd be, so whoever's watching this, please send Matt Oreos, all the varieties that, that yeah, Canada... I mean, like, it's, I mean, it's not the first time that some people brought me foreign food. I got, like, New Zealand cookies, and I even got Vegemite at one point. I know, I saw those. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Well, speaking of our Canada here, we have our uh. Canadian... <laughs> With a nice burp, mind you. Our favorite Canadian of the group is Animat, also known as Matt Brunet. Yes, and in today's podcast, we shall be discussing about, in honor of Ghost in the Shell, why is it that we need more white people playing more m characters? And that is today's lesson on how to piss off a weeaboo in less than five seconds. I could give two shits less. 
so <laughs> it be important. You're not a weeaboo. You're not affected. You're not affected by it. Not <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a Wapenese person, sir. <laughs> and last but not least is our cute co-host, Devin Cook. Hi! And I'm happy to be here for another round of Cinema Royale. Cinema Royale. Yeah, I'm just happy to be here. And just remember, folks, I'm here whenever. I'm just here. I show up in random places. I will hunt your nightmares. I will come after your dreams. Let's see what happens at this podcast. <laughs> you just need to annoy her to in order to get rid of her. You know, Matt, I could just that's kick why, your ass. That's why, that's, why she, that's why I always call her. She, she's known to be the ghost of you're an asshole. Because that's, that, she doesn't go boo. She goes you're an asshole. <laughs> I call you that all the time. I swear you. That's why I call you just, that. Well, yeah, the Animat, Matt, and Asshole are your three names that I know you as, and you respond to all three of them. <laughs> Trust me, it, it, one... it comes with a territory, you know that, right? <laughs> yeah, but you can't do that in public because then several people will turn their heads. It's like they'll think it's them. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you're in uh, New York. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Tonight's topic, of course, is all about the Japanese anime, animation films, also known as anime. Yes, in honor of Ghost in Shell that came out a couple of weeks ago. So, mm -hmm. we, we have a handful of anime films to talk about. And uh, let's start off with a iconic one from James Sullivan. Take it away, James. What do you have to offer to the podcast? Well, I don't know about iconic, but it, it does it does have some really standout moments in here. This was a this was a movie that I initially wanted to do when we did last year for war movies. Um, I the film that I I selected is from 1983, it, and it's called Barefoot Gen. Here is a little movie that I heard about. Back when I was uh, back when I was in college, I we watched a clip from it, and, and no, Mike, it's not the clip that I'm that I'm gonna show. It's uh, it's uh, it's one moment in there where for for some reason they decided to to show us one one scene where a guy sticks his chopstick in rice, but uh, but yes, this this movie is is actually. It's a, it's actually very infamous, and for a lot of reasons. Uh, uh, the whole premise is it takes place in 1945. It circles around a, a young man growing up in the farm area named Gan and his family. And they, uh, it's not just 1980, 1945, but they live in Hiroshima, and Something happened in 1945 in Hiroshima, kind of a big deal. And uh, yeah, so this, uh, so this, uh, this movie is essentially the story of how this young man uh, dealt with uh, dealt with the aftermath of the Hiroshima bombing. And that's why that's why uh, it's it's infamous uh, because for something that looks like a kids movie, it really it it really doesn't pull any punches. It really does not know how to be subtle. Uh, the um, uh, the um, the first thing that I'm gonna the first thing I'm gonna say is a lot of folks compare this movie to another another probably more well-known anime film called uh, called Grave of the Fireflies which who, who here has seen Grave, Grave of the Fireflies yeah those two so I have okay. seen it yeah Studio Ghibli mm -hmm. Studio Ghibli and and Matt, are you, Matt did you raise your hand I didn't see yeah of course mm-hmm 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, it's compared to that, obviously, because we're we're we got two movies where the uh, uh, the Hiroshima bombing is seen through the and the aftermath is seen through the eyes of uh, child characters who survive it. But the difference with the difference with Grave of the Fireflies, I think, is that is that it sort of after the bombing happens it sort of treats it like it sort of treats it like a footnote you know this happened uh, this uh, these two kids lives are ruined and the rest of it is you know not even dealing with the dealing with the uh, the radiation and the aftermath of the bombing and whatnot it's just sort of um, it, it's it's just sort of a, a a standard drama after that. This movie, Barefoot Gen, doesn't know how to be subtle. When it when the bomb drops, uh, that's that's really not the end of the subtlety here. Um, and now, what I'm about to show you, if I might, if I may do a screen share, and I hope that this works because I know the internet connection where I am right now is not exactly perfect. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and show you guys what I'm talking about. And don't worry, I have the sound turned off uh, here uh, so I don't blow my eardrums out. Uh, um. This is... This is a moment what happens right when the bomb drops, and so what you're what you're seeing is how it as how the film executes the scene and how it's animated. Uh, turn away if you're squeamish. Turn away. Yeah. I'll let you, I'll let you know uh, when you guys can look again. Uh, but yeah, we just watched a little girl, a grown man, get nuked, and oh, here's an old man getting uh, disintegrated and a mother and her baby child Ooh. how about how about a little bit more subtlety right here um yeah let's let's do the dog let's see what happens to a dog boom and this is that whole sequence this whole sequence is based around sketches from scientific uh from scientific uh, estimates as to what the human body would look like close up if it was hit by a nuclear bomb. The rest of this obviously is is just the a lot of the other stuff that happens, and uh, we know we don't know this bit of history. We we read about it in history books. Uh, oh yeah, yes, here's some glass. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you remember the scene, Mike? It was glorious. It was indeed. So I, I think I'm, I think I'm gonna stop it right about there because I've, I've traumatized viewers just enough. Oh yeah. As I say, it was kind of a fucking right. nightmare. So. What's that? It was a nightmare. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Not in watching the it film. Was... I was, yeah, that was a nightmare within itself. Yep. Hey, hey LT. Yes, I'm over at a, I'm over at LT's house tonight. Now the. So yeah, we see that the so we see that the kid, uh, so we see that Gen, actually survived, uh, the bombing, which is pretty which is pretty awesome but then he's subjected to he's subjected to watching his family burn to death which uh which we spent the first half hour of the film getting to like them and now we get to now we get to get traumatized even further and the rest of the movie is him dealing with more of the aftermath and they don't they don't do they don't do uh any 
uh, any lamp shading of the horrors uh, afterward. They got they got scenes with people people lined up, people who were infected, people digging maggots out of their flesh, and uh, uh, and it's uh, it, it's not a it's not a very subtle film, but the the thing that I find really amazing about it is it's disgusting, but it actually has a purpose. And it's moral of the film is something that pops out continuously throughout throughout the uh, film as it goes on. In the beginning, when when we find out more about Gen's family. And they're, you know, they. His father does this whole deal about, does this whole speech about wheat, and how it grows underground, and how it gets pounded by the weather, and how it get. You can burn it, whatever you can, you can pound it with rain, it, beat the crap out of it with all four seasons, and in the springtime it comes back up again. So. That's kind of the that's kind of the message of this film is uh, with with every negative thing that happens somehow Gen and his mother who's the only other survivor manage to find something good out of out of this mess that they've been handed and the whole message about survival it, it's pretty much saying as odd as it sounds be like grain. So that's that's why that's why I wanted to bring this up as a as a film, and also because also because in in terms of uh, looking back on Hiroshima as a historical event, I always got I always got a very slanted view. Uh, I always got a, a, a very slanted view um, from. Uh, from learning about it in high school, we read the book Hiroshima. We, uh, you know, we, we um, listened to Robert, you know, General McNamara, who I believe is the, his name, the guy who uh, made the call to drop the bomb. And there's a lot of, yeah, there's the way that we learned about Hiroshima in school was always U.S. guilt, U.S. guilt, U.S. guilt, U.S. guilt, U.S. guilt. US guilt. This is a movie. This is a movie that doesn't really take any sides. It's it's a very anti-war film, period. But it also heavily criticizes uh, the Japanese government and their involvement in World War II. To be, I found it to be uh, very. A very brave, I should say. Uh, all, all things considered. I don't know what uh, Devin I, and Mike. I know you, you two have seen it now. What, uh, what do you guys have to say about it? <laughs> um. Well, Mike, do you want to go first or me? Doesn't matter if you want to go first. Well, I think I would like to go first, just because. With me, I'm a huge World War II history buff, so for me, I really got, like, I will admit this. Having seen both Barefoot Gen and Grave of the Fireflies, I think it's interesting that the two films took it from a completely different perspective. While, mm -hmm. you know, how Grave of the Fireflies was mainly about these children, these two children, and the aftermath of their lives... I think it's interesting that Barefoot Gen sort of does this, but they do it with more emphasis on the bomb than, than Grave of the Fireflies does. But I think, mm -hmm. as traumatizing as that bomb scene was, it really did, like, it shocked me. Just because, like, I was like, God damn, is that brutal imagery. It is brutal. Like, after watching it again, you can't get it out of your head. It will not leave you. It didn't leave me the night I watched it either. It was a nightmare. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, no. Were you having... Uh, I, wasn't ha were you... I didn't have... No, I didn't have nightmares, luckily. But it, just watching it that night, I was like, ugh. And it just su surprised me. Then again, I'll never... It's kind of like never forgetting 
seeing the ending where, like, seeing, you know, the kids from the Grave of the Fireflies slowly lose their bone, like, get to almost bone. Like, you can't, like, this, you know, when you have lost all fat and all tissue and stuff and you're literally seeing bones? It, mm -hmm. It's kind of that imagery. It's, like, strong imagery that will not leave you. You, like, no matter how many times, like, you don't have to see the movie more than once. It's that kind of imagery that will not leave your head. And I think I liked, I will admit I liked Grave of the Fireflies more, just because I think that was more of a character-driven story about these two kids and how they reacted to the whole Hiroshima. Like, this is their perspective. This was a teenage kid who was trying to raise his little sister after the bomb went off and after he tried to get away from his aunt and that kind of thing. I mean, there's more of a and, stronger connection with the kids in that movie. And it's not much of a spoiler alert, no. but uh, because it because the movie starts off with this. But yeah, uh, we in that in that film they fail. Exactly. And but the, but yeah, Grave of the Fireflies did uh, did affect it. It was effective because it was emotional though i think too i think that's the main difference yeah grave of the fireflies is more of an emotional movie like this is grabbing at your heartstrings from the moment it starts so yeah that's not a spoiler alert that's pretty much revealed at the beginning of the movie and but for barefoot i do like that these characters like you do get to relate to the family before the bomb goes off and most of them are dead um, but I like that the movie pretty much is, like, about this kid who's learning to grow up. He's dealing with all this, he's, like, growing up faster because of, well, the bomb going off and mm -hmm. losing most of his family. So, I mean, I think that's an interesting perspective. Like, one movie is about the failure of what happens when you overstep your boundaries, and the other one is pretty much saying, you can do this, it's just going to take a lot of hard work. Both films yeah. have completely different directions in the film. It's almost the same, you know, the almost a similar conflict, but the endings are completely different from the two films. Almost. Exact. That. Well, yeah, I think you have a you have a good point there. They they do end differently. Um. Yeah, with the. Uh, it, Gens. Yeah, the the issue with Gen is that it's it's more about shock value, I think. Yeah, I think Barefoot Gen is very much a shock value movie. It's not mm -hmm. a, like Grave of the Fireflies is very emotional. That's why a lot of people remember that movie more because that really affects your emotions from the very start. Barefoot was just it's an interesting perspective and on a really image really shocking imagery. So. I mean, I see nothing wrong with Barefoot, but I'm going to remember Grave of the Fireflies more, only on the emotional level. <laughs> I'm sorry, but yeah. what did... I saw Grave of the Fireflies, and I was crying my eyes out. I was depressed after that movie. This one just... This one, I mean, it was good, but it didn't nearly hit my heartstrings as much. Mm -hmm. That's me. Yeah, yeah. And we, got, both we got some unique and we got some unique responses. Mike, would you like to tell them uh, the part where you actually started laughing while we were watching? Uh, if I remember, let me see if I remember because that was a while ago. Um, Do I have two nights ago? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's. Two nights. I'm sorry. It's uh, the, like like. It was a, a the long time ago. If it, barefoot, long time ago. Barefoot Jen is, that's the thing though, you remember it for being <laughs> that one scene being when the bomb hits and everybody's, <sighs> that's it. Everything else, hit or miss, like, well, what was I laughing at? That's the thing, what was I even like? There was, there, there's a moment in there that, that creeps me out every, every time after every, that, creeps me out after every every time I, I watch the movie. It's after the bombing, after the burning, 
after the scene where the the family is burning, but then the the moment the mom realizes that her family is burning to death, she snaps and starts laughing. Oh yes, I started laughing with her. I was like, because <laughs> I was laughing. Oh. I was laughing with her. Yes, because I just thought she. That was like a quick turnaround. I was like, what the fuck's going on with the woman? Just she just snapped. She just snapped. It's like. <laughs> She w- oh. she goes she goes Joker crazy after that. She was like just for a moment. Okay, yeah. See, I go loony. Yeah. No, it's it's an interesting movie. I mean, especially war films in general. You know, stuff that takes place during the the war era kind of thing. Especially if it's World War Two or World War One or whatever. And being that perspective of the bomb hitting that's kind of neat to see what happens and of course the radiation the explosion like i said it's the most iconic thing hell i could i mean we could keep playing that clip forever because that's the only thing you can remember from that movie um uh, other than the people other than the soldiers losing their hair and bleeding out of their buttocks that sort of thing yeah well that too i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of blood and a lot of like deaths going on it's like weird but it's um i mean jen's whole evolution as a character is interesting because he starts out as a normal boy and then all of a sudden after the bomb hits he starts becoming the man of the family because of course his dad his brother and i believe his sister burned to death and now he's going to take care of his mother and the newborn baby Mm -hmm. as they try to survive this new post not post apocalyptic but just like just post like bombing mm-hmm. and it's... but here's something i want to mention before the mm. english dub the voice actress who did the voice of jen also had a key role in voicing alpha 5 from the power rangers oh. as one of her roles like she does she's, she's done other roles in anime but that's just something like ay 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 ay. So that so that's so that's what's popping up in Mike's head as we're watching the movie. I was like every, I was like ay ay ay. Ay ay ay. Every time something <laughs> everything every time Gens doing something I think ay ay ay. Ay ay ay. Never knew we would go from barefoot gen to Power Rangers. <sighs> I just, I was looking yeah, up, I was, I was, I was, Oh, the baby's dying. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> oh, no, we gotta call the Power Rangers. Get five <laughs> teenage with attitudes. Oh. Mom just exploded. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I have that vision in my head. Um, no. But... Yeah, that's when the regular Alpha Five turn into the uh, new version of the Alpha Five. <laughs> <laughs> that's how the process went. Um, yeah, the movies. I mean, it's it's decent. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna say. I'll, I mean, it's a one time viewing for me. I'm not gonna like rewatch it over and over. It's just, it is just wow with the grotesque moments and there's blood and, I mean. I don't know. There's there's a but sequel, that's, but that's why yeah there is a sequel which uh, which doesn't have an English dub. It's got a subtitle. It's they're subtitled, but I'll be watching that at some other point. In the meantime, yeah, that's that's one thing I think that's perfectly fine about anime. Oh, thank you. Is that even with their family films, or I, I don't even know if, know if I should call this a family film. Um, they, they, uh, they are able to deal with, uh, uh, with, with material that's a lot more adult than, than we typically would in U.S., in, in the U.S., uh, audiences, you know, minus Sausage Party. Um, yeah, LT is here, folks. Say hello. Hi. And so, uh, but yeah, and that's what I—that's a thing that I think 
that's the theme that I think we're going to be uh, looking at with the rest of these with the rest of these movies as we go on here. But uh, unfortunately, I got to cut out right now because I'm chilling with my boy over here. Mm-hmm. Yes, thank yeah. you, thank you for your time, James. Thanks for coming on, and you just have a good night, man. Yep. You go have fun with All right, you too. Yeah. Have fun. I'll tell him. I'll tell him you guys to hi. Indeed. Right. No problem. All right. Peace. See ya. Yeah. So, I mean, this basically mm -hmm. said with Barefoot Gen. I mean, it's just it's just that movie. Just, I mean, not into war films exactly. I mean, depending on what the movie is, but uh, the let's just go to the next movie being uh the whole reason why we're all here in the first place because. This is the original anime version of Ghost in the Shell. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Ghost in the Shell. I remember when I first watched this, when I had to do the um, top ten best animated sequels more, uh, more than five years ago now. Uh, it was mostly because I wanted to check out how is the sequel, uh, Innocence. And I found myself uh, discovering that Ghost in the Shell is pretty much one, uh, one of, if not my favorite Japanese animated feature that is not from Studio Ghibli. It is so amazing. I mean, maybe this could sound really stupid for me, but the best way that I can describe it is that this is literally an animated, the animated film version of probably the most beautiful woman that you can ever imagine. It has both the looks and the intelligence. The look, it is amazing. The animation is beautiful. And especially in terms of the creativity that they put in to create this um, th th this kind of not necessarily dystopian future, but this uh, cyber uh, a cybernetic future, where like you got natural human beings, but you also got cyborgs at the same time, where you don't necessarily die. Your body just goes into uh, <clears throat> your body goes into a robot, and suddenly there's this hacker that would come in and try to screw everything up and this is where you also get a lot of the action and it would also please uh people who are really into that like they they're into like like all this like cut like kicking butt action and all that stuff it's really awesome how they pull it off here and especially when they can go like heavy duty like with tanks and stuff like that like, it, it goes into Metal Gear levels, no joke, and no pun intended either. Nice. Uh, uh, that and also the characters are absolutely memorable with uh, Motoko, and you also got Mato, that's another favorite of mine. Then you also got a few other human characters as well that are on the side trying to help them out, where you basically got these two cyborgs working for the police force and trying to figure out what this entire... Thing is going on with the hacker and stuff like that but then you also got the intelligence and this is where the true life of the movie comes in and you also got oh and i almost forgot to mention about this one villain the, well the villain that they got the puppet master where he's not a being of any sorts all he is it's kind of like this ghost it's it's probably the best way to put it because he hacked into uh, a woman cyborg and that's the only way that they can communicate is that um, it's through this woman cyborg which somehow ended up being hit by a truck and um, afterwards the the puppet master was pretty much controlling from there and that's when um, we start to discover about the you know the, the philosophy that this movie has because this is also not only uh, an action film, but this is also a very philosophical film in a level that like you would actually understand because it talks about life and having a soul, you know, kind of, it, it's almost going into the levels of uh, discussions about meaning, uh, the like the meaning of life and stuff like that. And that's why I feel like um, one of the most memorable scenes of this movie or the memorable scene, it's not necessarily any of the action that Motoko would go through. I mean, yeah, like a lot of the people love the opening scene where she would break, she would become invisible and then break through a building, or the one that she had to chase in the middle of, the, like, chase this one guy in the middle of town. Uh, but the most memorable scene is when Bato and Motoko would just sit on a boat, and um, you know they would just relax and just talk about their purpose in life. 
Like it really was powerful and it really was thought provoking. Like it, it definitely is a smart movie right there. If I may dab, oh, now keep in mind though, I haven't seen any of the more recent Ghost in the Shell stuff. I haven't seen any of the animes that came out. I didn't see the new movie of it. And uh, well, the new anime movie, but and also I have yet to see uh, the live action reboot of Ghost in the Shell, but I am planning to. I am interested to seeing that regardless. Uh, but I have seen Innocence, and that one I gotta say that it definitely is good. It has that great animation, and you know, it, it is still cool. Like, even though you don't have Matoko in there, it's awesome that like you have a movie starring Pato. But my one criticism for it is that this is a movie that is legitimately too, uh, literally too smart because it is filled with nothing but philosophical questions. Like you need a diploma in philosophy to understand what the frick they're even talking about. Like there's one quote that they even continue to say is like, ah oh, yes, it is like an elephant in the forest. And I'm just there like, what the frick are you talking about? <laughs> And then, like, they, they would also go, it's like, ah, but Confucius say this, ah, but Nietzsche says this. It's like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> no, but yeah, overall is to say that Ghost in the Shell is definitely one of the best uh, anime movies out there. I highly recommend you guys go check it out. So beautiful, so action-packed. Absolutely adore it. And uh, we got some recent news as well. They, since the uh, live-action reboot is not doing so well in hot water right now, they announced they're doing a new animated reboot of Ghost in the Shell. Oh my god, they, they just did the same thing. I think they just did the same thing as Godzilla. So It's pretty much uh, the Japanese to say, we apologize for this America. We apologize for America screwing up again. So we're going to go and do a proper version this time. Yep. So no, no, don't 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 mind that major bullcrap there. We'll give you more multiple. <laughs> so yeah, I just wanted to say that because I just popped up in my newsfeed. I was like, oh okay, new animated Ghost yeah. in the Shell reboot. It's okay. See that in the future. But yeah, it's just very iconic shit. I mean, yeah. So definitely check that out. Uh, but you know what's next? Let's talk about Kiki. Let's talk about Kiki. Let's. What are you gonna talk about Kiki, Devin? Yes, we're gonna talk. First, I want to say one thing. I agree with Matt completely on Ghost in the Shell. Very good movie. Don't need to explain more. No. But with Kiki, this was a childhood film for me. Hell, I owned the VHS. <laughs> 1995. Why didn't you own the DVD or the Blu-ray? <laughs> uh, you know what, Matt? You can go fuck yourself and let me explain. For yeah. fuck's sake. 1989. Ah, oh, that's a good year indeed. Why are you swearing so much in here? <laughs> you know what, Matt? Do you know what you deserve? I'm giving you this on the podcast. Yay! As I was saying, before the anime pain in the ass decided to interrupt me, like he always does, because that's his fucking problem. Okay, as I was saying, um, this movie for me... <laughs> Kiki, um, what are you going to say about the movie? Shut the fuck up. As I was saying... <laughs> oh, whatever. Well, for me, this movie growing up was always that movie. I never knew this was Studio Ghibli until I was in my teenage years. I always assumed this was another Disney movie, but then again, to be fair, Disney released, distributed the dubs, so you can't really fault me for that one. <laughs> of course. But, see, you can't fault me for that. That's not my fault. But, as you were saying, but... I think it's interesting with Kiki, because, yeah, growing up with this movie, I saw the VHS 1995 dub. With the American pop songs added into the score and the ending of, well, Phil Hartman added, having more lines in the movie. Well, what's interesting with the 2012 Blu-ray slash DVD is the fact that they fixed some of the problems that people were having with the original Disney dub that they did. Um, because in the Disney dub, it was actually, like the 95 dub, it was actually not as true to the original, um, 
ki- the sub the original Kiki movie. It was really the ending of the movie was supposed to be where spoilers. If you've seen this movie, good for you. But if you haven't, this is more for the fans who've seen this movie. Um, spoiler alert: the movie ends with Kiki learning to like she saves the kid named Tombo from the from the I don't even know what they're called the blimp. Is it the it's blimp a, or yeah, it's a blimp. blimp? It's a blimp. Okay, I was just talk, I'm just double checking. Well, um, so she saves Tombo from the blimp, and Kiki and her cat Gigi, the black cat, comes down, and he doesn't say anything at the end of the movie. He says absolutely nothing, but at the Disney dub, he starts talking, and she can hear him and understand him like before. Well, the original movie's intent was the fact that. This was a movie about Kiki growing up. This was... Her talking to her cat was the symbol of immaturity. At the end of the movie, her not being able to talk to her cat anymore was representing the fact that she was growing up. She was trying to be more mature. And I think it's interesting with the 2012 dub, not only did they fix... Like, they got rid of the pop songs completely and they rewrote the score or redid the score, actually, they also changed, they fixed the ending to be more like the original. And I will give it props for that. I applaud the Disney company for actually allowing to fix this problem from the original and make, and make it more true to the original anime. Great. Nothing wrong with that. But I will admit, in my heart, I actually prefer... The 95 dub. Just because it's more nostalgic. But I think the main thing I should say about this movie, besides the fact that this is the most simple plot on the planet, with Kiki being a 13-year-old witch, moving to a new town, and learning to grow up in a complete... Like, learn to be on her own for a year. That's the plot of the movie. And she meets these new characters, like the bakery woman who owns the woman who owns a bakery her husband who's a baker um she meets this boy named tombo she meets these older elderly women that she delivers for and etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera. the movie is really a simple plot it's just the most simple plot on the planet and i think that's what works about it because this movie is very character driven it's a character gr- it's a character driven movie about this little girl moving to a new city it's about kiki herself and she meets these people and she learns about what's it like to grow up and what's it like to have like insecurities and her not and with her losing her powers part way through the film she's like freaking out because this is not because she's never had this problem before like this is insecurities these were things that all teenagers go through and I think it's interesting that this movie is really about teenagers' insecurities and maturity versus maturity, in- independence versus dependence and stuff like that. So I think for me, this movie hit the right chords for me growing up. Because, like, I think if you've seen Doug Walker's video, like the Disney Sember, he describes it perfectly, what this movie is. This movie represents pretty much growing up it's a, and you care about these characters. This movie is so simple that the characters are the stars. It's not the plot itself, it's the characters you care about. You find yourself so absorbed into the world that Miyazaki has written here that you don't you don't realize that you're getting angry over the fact that there was a that there was this bitch woman that didn't want to take the grandmother's herring pie. <laughs> You realize you're getting angry over something really silly. <laughs> and, I don't know, just for me, this was one of those kind of movies for me. It was a very simple, but very endearing story. And I love it for that. I love movies that are character-driven. I love movies that dive into certain subjects that are relatable for not only teenagers, but teenage girls especially. So... I guess for me, I think I found a more appreciation for it growing up because, you know, you can, I could relate to Kiki a little bit having, you know, not always feeling like feeling insecure about myself. Um, 
not always feeling like I fit in, that kind of stuff. Everyone feels like that. And I think overall, I like the not only the Kiki Kiki's delivery service. I never seen the original subbed version. I wish I kind of did before the podcast, but it never happened. But I love seeing the dub again because it just reminded me of my childhood. And I think it's good that, like, seeing the dub again, like, I loved the casting of this. Like, Kirsten Dunst was perfect as Kiki. Phil Hartman was great as the cat. Debbie Reynolds was one of the, it was one of the elderly people that she meets. Sorry, that freaked me out. I was so excited. Now, other voice actors, like, um, Kath, Kathy Sosi, Jeff Bennett, and et cetera, et cetera. There's just many well-known people that signed up for this, and it's great to see a movie from Studio Ghibli that no, not only... I think, for me, this is the movie I think of when I think of a simple story with magical elements that I like a lot. And you may compare this to... A lot of people compare this to My Neighbor Totoro, which I understand why a lot of people like My Neighbor Totoro, but I actually prefer... Kiki a lot more for the reasons I pretty much described here. Mm-hmm. So that's my thoughts on the film. Matt? Yeah, uh, I definitely agree right there. Um, I'm definitely one of those people that actually do prefer Kiki's delivery service over My Neighbor Totoro because I feel like with Kiki, it kind of succeeds in what my na- <laughs> this is going to be really controversial to say, but like, Kiki kind of succeeds where My Neighbor Totoro didn't, and that is the perfect blend of the regular slice of life with the magical component. With My Neighbor Totoro, you do get to, like, you kind of come in with this entire promise that you would get all these, um, you know, you would get all these whimsical adventures with Totoro and stuff like that with the two little girls. But the movie mostly consists of just the two little girls and their life, while you only get, like, maybe 15 minutes max with any sort of interactions with Totoro. Now, the, the scenes with Totoro are great, but other than that, you just get two little girls running and screaming. With Kiki, however, the two of them blend well because it stars this witch going through this slice-of-life adventure where she has to learn to become her own woman, to be her own witch, and decided to go and start her own business as a, kind, of a deli- kind of this delivery service to go and deliver packages and stuff like that and um for the most part it's actually you know it's all it's really fascinating to see kiki's adventures and how it is to uh, like to see how she would progress like she's no longer a kid and she has to face all these different responsibilities and try to figure out what is right what is wrong while also dealing with you know the unique quirk of being a witch in a normal people world like what what is actually really interesting like one scene that does stand out is when kiki would just fly would first fly around uh the entire village and you know when people were noticing her like they kind of see her not necessarily kind of like this oh my god it's a witch witch run for your lives or stuff like that they like they kind of see like oh it's just oh okay, it's a witch in training. Ah okay, <laughs> like uh, like uh, I guess like as long as she doesn't fully screw up, then I guess she'll be fine, you know, because like it it does really show how we are in this world, uh like where witches do exist and like going you know going through like all the different things of becoming a witch is no different than just like practicing practicing a religion or stuff like that you know like this is uh for witches what kiki is going through is uh it's it's like a form of a ritual so that's what i really appreciate from kiki is that it blends well with the mythical element where you see all the witchcraft and stuff like that and kiki flying with her broom which does bring up some beautiful animation moments uh but also some little slice of life moments where it really does make it easy to relate to Kiki, how you can see that she really is a believable character. Oh, oh yeah, I, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Cause, it, yeah, you do bring up a good point. Like, 
Yeah, I also feel the same way about my neighbor Totoro. It, I didn't know if they how how they mixed it. I did, didn't mix very well. Like it mixed enough, but I can't really say it was a great film. It was, I liked it okay, but I thought Kiki just was able to blend those two elements well. Yeah, because technically at the beginning of the movie they describe she's thirteen. She's at the age of thirteen. All witches are moving, from have to move out of town, stay there for a year and practice with their powers and see who they become that's the whole point the magical elements kind of already represented the very start and as the movie goes on you're not only getting the flying scenes but you're also getting her talking to her cat and um you're getting like her trying to figure out her life in general i mean to me i think that was a way better movie just on emotional level like kiki is a very believable character you can relate to feeling insecure about yourself. You can relate to wanting, like, she, she's troubled about what people think of her. I mean, that's relatable stuff. People go through that all the time. Where you feel like, oh, at first you're, like, you're really confident about yourself. And then all of a sudden people are back-talking you and you're freaking out because you're like, are there, what bad things are they saying about me? Or are they saying bad things about me? I mean, that's relatable. A lot of teenagers go through that. It's just growing up and realizing who you are you know it's just crazy I'm like I don't know it's just funny I just grew up loving this movie so much as a kid and I still love it a lot more as an adult for me this is it's not my favorite Kiki movie now there's one that's actually a lot more this is probably my second favorite Kiki movie favorite Studio Ghibli film that they've done but it's a very high, high honor for Studio Ghibli. They've done some great work. And yeah. this will be one of those proofs of that. So that's, for me, why also... It's also a film with a woman protagonist. Good job, well, Studio I mean, Ghibli. Well, I mean, with Hayao Miyazaki, they've done a lot of those. Oh, of I mean, course. Like, like, Miyazaki is said to be... Uh, like a well-known feminist so like of course he wants to prominently show like how a, what, like an actual female protagonist and honestly that is kind of surprising that when like you see people discussing about feme like female protagonists in movies and stuff like that like how to correctly portray a woman as a main character um i wonder how many of those people would point to uh studio ghibli to do that because those are great examples rather it be like i'm just looking up uh in my collection like you got nausicaa you got kiki uh you got chihiro you got yeah chihiro uh you got ponyo you got arietti and um even some of the even from the ones other than uh, miyazaki like you got kaguya you got anna from when from when marnie was there um you also got uh uh, like movies like Whisper of the Heart or The Cat Returns. Yeah, there's a lot of those. Um, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, well, Studio Ghibli's done amazing women in their movies, and really, I love the fact that they do that. Mm -hmm. Good oh, job, Studio one. Ghibli. Oh, yeah. Seriously, like, they're probably the only animation studio that I'm aware of that really prominently makes women the star of their movies. I mean, technically, you could you could technically count Disney Animation as well, but like I know that they have some bad examples. But at least Disney in recent years, like at I least was gonna with, say, uh, yeah, with protagonists like like strong, even Disney, yeah, like with strong with strong female protagonists. You know, like uh, Anna and Elsa from Frozen. Uh, you got Judy Hopps Tiana. from Zootopia. Tiana. Um, who else? I was thinking Moana. Um, yeah, Moana. Uh, they're Rapunzel from Tangled. And I mean, you can even go back to some of the Renaissance ones, like uh, Mulan. Or Jasmine. Yeah. Belle. Well, Jasmine is not the star. It's well, Aladdin. okay, okay, okay. Belle, technically, but you're, yeah. But you're allowed to say girlism on the side. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> but whatever. But yeah, like... I like I just like I say yeah. Besides Disney, yeah, Disney, you gotta really talk about the recent years if you're gonna talk about strong female protagonists. But like I said, you can 
You can say, oh, Disney's been doing this to oh, the oh, independent. Oh, yeah, and also, oh, yeah, there's one that I just thought of, uh, uh, Belle from Beauty and the Beast. That's another one. I just said, whatever. Okay. Yes, I did. Yes, I said I Belle. I heard it. I heard it. She said it. Yes, I did. I said Belle. You're an idiot. Whatever. But, yeah, Disney's been doing women protagonists for years, but I'm talking about strong, independent women. You can, that's, Studio Ghibli technically, just, I guess not did it first, but they were, like, uh, one of the more prominent. No, but, like, they're the ones who, like, they're the more prominent. The yeah, they perfected it. Um, I, I would say, technically, the only other animator that had made women the strong, like, his prominent characters were Don Bluth. Yeah, uh, oh, Don yeah, that Bluth. is true. Like Don Bluth. Uh, would Anastasia count? Yes, Anastasia counts, because that's Don Bluth. Anastasia. How about Thumbelina? No. Well, no. <laughs> Alright, no, don't you start with Thumbelina. Alright. Uh, I'm trying to think. No, I think those are it. Yeah, those are the main. That's what I'm just saying. The, the main. The Studio Ghibli perfected the women, independent woman. Disney was able to catch on and get to it. Well, and I Don mean, with, Ghibli, well. They have, with, with Studio Ghibli, they kind of have to be independent considering that, like, they really are young. They're kind of like, they're in the age of, like, either kids or teens or stuff like that. Yeah. The, like, I think the oldest one that they crafted as a, a like, a strong, like, a female protagonist is, like, debatably Arnetti or Nausicaa. I think, isn't Nausicaa? I would think Nausicaa, because Arietti doesn't seem like an adult. But she's small, like, I said God. debatably. That's why I said debatably. <sighs> debatable. That's debatable. Aria, Arietti is debatable. Nausicaa would probably be, I'm just saying out of, probably out of demography, I would say probably, um, probably, probably Nausicaa. Because I do uh, what about Princess Mononoke? Well, I don't know, because she's not necessarily the main character. She, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a title, but it's not her. Yeah, a, that's true. Like, the boy ah, is the... I don't even remember. <laughs> I haven't seen that movie in forever. No, I'm, I have no idea. Like, I think you'd have, that's a really good debate, actually. Who's actually, the oldest? Uh, his name, Ashitaka, there we go, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, it's more Ashitaka's movie than it is uh, Mononoke's. Yeah, that's true. I was gonna say, that would be a funny little debate. Who's the oldest um, woman character in a Ghibli film? Who's the oldest woman in a Ghibli film? Wait a minute, what about... Oh, wait, no. Well, the oldest one would probably be The Witch of the Waste. I was... Th no, 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 no. I'm trying to think. Oh, no, wait, there's also Sophie. I almost forgot. Yeah, Sophie from Hell's Moving Castle. <laughs> Yeah, ah, she's technically well. Then again, that movie is really weird with the how she grows older and that kind of stuff. But no, 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 I was, she's, no she's she's like what's young. The spell done on her. Yeah, no, she's like technically she is young. Well, yeah, I'm just saying the oldest. Like, who would be the oldest? Like I said, the witch of the waste. Main characters, you motherfucker. I'm saying I... either. Either Nausicaa or, um, well, at least in terms of the female ones, because the winner would hands down be probably, uh, she, uh, no, uh, Jido Horikoshi from Wind Rises. But in terms of female oh. ones, I would probably say either Nausicaa or Sophie. Probably Nausicaa. Oh, actually, that would be a fun little debate. Just, I'm a bit of, see which one you think it is. I got nothing else. <laughs> Fun fact, Kiki's delivery service is based on a book. That is true, actually. Yep. Based on I a European for... book, actually. I never read it, but i actually been kind of wanting to. Apparently there's like five sequels. No joke. There's five sequels to that it's a, book. It's, it's a book series, so if you want to hey. read the source, read the source. It's... Yeah, that's true. I was gonna say Studio Ghibli's known for doing book to movie adaptations a lot. Yeah, it's true mm. that Kiki is very European based, especially like around the Swedish area. Like in terms of its art, like the architecture around the village that Kiki goes to. 
Yeah, I think they probably got inspiration from probably the book and probably little towns in Japan. I don't remember though. But... Uh, no, no, not not Japan. I don't well. remember. Uh, don't take my word for it. Definitely yeah, I was gonna say you did the you did the re you did the Studio GB look back on that you would probably have that fact still better than I do. Yeah, yeah. So. Wait, wait, what? Wait. Yeah. There's there's a live action Kiki's delivery service. Yes. Oh yeah. That came out in 2014. <laughs> yeah. I refuse I to see that. <laughs> I don't know if it's either this one or something else, but. I think there's also like a Japanese musical on Kiki. Yes, oh, you you are correct. Japanese. Yes, that was in that was like during the '90s, so it's not even. But yeah, they, they made a musical of it. So. Thank you. That's I so oh my god, I didn't know about the musical till I did the research. But God, what? There's a musical. You know, I can't wait for the musical. I'm gonna fly, I'm gonna fly. Okay, just, they're just gonna play all, like, if it comes to America, like, they would probably just play all those, um, uh, what was it, like, play all those American songs that they put on the uh, animated film. Touche. <laughs> I'm not even gonna argue that, because that might be true. <laughs> uh, Kiki's Delivery Service is a Japanese novel. Yeah, it's a Jap. It was based off of a Japanese novel. It's not European at all. Oh, or well, yeah. well, no. Like I know that there is like European inspirations from. Oh, okay. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, I just think that they said. Castle, or Australian. Uh, yeah, it's probably House Moving. Yeah. Yeah, I was say House Moving Castle was based off of a European book. Then again, when Marnie was there, it was also based off of a book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. based off of a book. Marnie. I mean, I mean, most anime films are based on the manga of the same name, which uh, is true. And with uh, Studio Ghibli films, they're based on books, not like mangas, like so. And it is actually very interesting when you see that, considering that, like, consider we're in North America, so we're way too accustomed with uh, American studios adapting. Uh, anything that they want, including Japanese properties like uh, Ghost in the Shell, but and then you see the re- but but then you suddenly see the reverse that's going on in Japan, where you got uh, an American book or um, English literature that inspired a Japanese animated film. Mm-hmm. Or funny enough, when they do a, 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 do an American property and make it turn in, and turn into an anime. Hey, look, I thought of an example. Remember that Stitch anime? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stitch. And then there's also yeah. Powerpuff Girls. Yeah, there's Powerpuff Girls. In- uh, what? Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> I mean, all right, well, not the, the reboot counts. Like, I, I was going to say, I don't know what's scarier, the fact that there's an anime or the fact that they did a reboot, but I'm not going into that without crazy fanboys or fangirls going, yeah, we might be good. Yeah, we get it. Beware the weeaboos, man. Beware the weeaboos. <laughs> so, I decided to talk about a anime film that is dubbed as a manime, because it's the most manly anime movie you can ever watch, ever. It's Fist of the North Star. Um, Fist of the North Star uh, is a 1986 anime film uh, based on the manga of the same name, and it's been it's animated by Toei Animation, which is the same company that also did the te- the television series around the same time uh, in the I'm 80s. Sorry, Roger, you probably know who to- what Toei is, or if you're like an anime fan in general. It, toy is like, toy, yeah, Toy is like they, they've. Oh my God! If you've seen the most anime shows, they've done Sailor Moon, they've done Digimon, they've done Dra- Dragon Ball. They've you just look at the list of the stuff they've did. They have done a lot of good animation stuff. They've great animation studio. Um, Fist of the North Star is an interesting thing because the plot of the of the movie just it's very like confusing to follow in a way because 
mind you, this is based off the manga and the television series, which has a longer episode run or pages. This is just, it's, it's like an almost two hour movie, and it's just set in a post post apocalyptic world because world a war has happened and you have these like it's like mad max in a way it's like their version of mad max because they take inspiration from the road warrior when it came out and uh you have this main character named ken in the american dub uh the japanese dub and japanese original is kenshiro he is like a mix between uh bruce lee jesus and mad max basically <laughs> because bad Bruce bad Bruce Christ <laughs> yeah. basically because it's it's ba- because yeah he's he's the master of a certain karate uh master martial arts and he's just he's like once you see him fight oh my god it's like he just like you know he's grabbing people from the head and just and blood just spurts out and he punches and taps people heads are exploding all over the place it's like, it's, and mind you, in the original television series, they didn't do a lot of gory stuff, but this, with the movie, they took liberties and made it a lot gorier. So you see all this blood and guts, like, and of, of course, you know, Kinshiro, he's like going, <laughs> he's punching and kicking all at the same time, and then, you're already dead. Boom. The heads explode, like, blood just pours out everywhere, it cuts and arms and it's it's so bloody oh man it, it's like the most blood you ever see in an anime movie ever like oh my god it is just gory and it's just amazing because it's the manly because you root for ken because kenshiro is just the badass of the month holy shit <laughs> i almost just like there's an awe of all the and mind you the um the movie you when they cut the vi- the violence the bloodiness it goes into this like color they c- kind of discolor it so it's not for censoring because of course it's violence it's very brutal to see it in full color but there is actually a, a italian vhs copy of it that has no coloring with it so it's like all uncensored which is weird so if you watch the movie you see all the it's like a bluish hue when it goes to the violence so it's it's just very interesting to see that i mean the movie like i said the plot is not even there because you see kenshiro he's like saving people in this world you meet two kids named uh bat and lin lin is uh mute and of course being kenshiro he's like jesus in a way he heals uh Lynn's muteness so she can talk now because basically Lynn's story is that the war happened her parents burned dead and she just never talked ever since and so she's like in awe of it so Kinshiro was the hero I was like I can talk now um it's just yeah he has to fight these it's basically like Super Mario in a way because uh, one of his friends turn rival takes his girlfriend and he has just has to save him so he has to fight all these baddies then there's like a gang you meet a gang called a Z gang and they have, he has to beat those people up and it's just a, you know a manly fight him up kind of movie you know you see all blood and guts and you see how Kinshiro is a badass because at the beginning you see Kinshiro die spoiler alert but he rises up because he's Jesus, but when he comes back, he is like, because he's thrown off of a cliff, he comes back and he's all like stoned, it's like, it comes off eventually as he walks, but he's like punching the buildings, and the buildings are coming down, psh, just by one punch, and then a building's like coming on top of his head, and he just walks through it like nothing, you know, the, the building gets going right through his head, just like, psh, nothing's happening, and it's like, dude, you don't want to fucking Kinshiro, because he's like the ultimate badass. I'm sorry, it just, it, it's just amazing, like, it's, people should watch Fist of the North Star, it's like, it is, like, one of the most greatest early anime movies out there. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> I should have warned yeah. you, I should have warned you about that, because... Yeah. 
<laughs> I should have warned you about that because I wasn't too sure how you would react to all the blood goriness. <laughs> yeah, I was about ready to get a bucket for that. I don't <laughs> like gory movies at all. So this was even worse. Oh no. I, like, I don't know. I can't handle blood very well. It makes me feel sick. I mean, and, like I said, no, like I said, they they they, they kind of censor it by discoloring the scene, making it bluish tone, not fully. Yeah, but it's still, still bloody as fucking hell. I know. I, swear, I couldn't watch half of the movie because I was plugging my eyes trying to go. When is this gonna be over? When is this gonna be over? <laughs> and it's I just, it, no. Like I get why it appeals to people like you. You're very much into post-apocalyptic, gory, manly movies. I'm a woman. I don't like to see blood and guts. I'm not into the post apocalyptic I can't even say post apocalyptic movies very much. But I they're kinda of boring to me except for this for some of the few like Hunger Games and blah blah blah. Right. But I digress. Like I'm just not into I'm not into those kind of movies and I mean I get the appeal. It's this like like I, like, I know the one anime that everybody likes that is so goddamn bloody and gory and gooey and, uh, is Akira. Everyone loves that, and yeah. I can't stand it. Yeah, everybody talks about like Akira, it. and I'm surprised that they actually talked about this in this episode. Uh, but, but yeah, like, that's another iconic one for animes. But like the, the most iconic anime out there, and I'm like, I don't like it at all. Yeah, I, I, think I didn't want to oh, touch that with a 10-foot pull because i know it's iconic i've seen it but it's just it's too weird for me like i should crank up that blu-ray actually come to think of it i was gonna say you I, well, it, it's bloody like that like i i know it's not like bloody it's probably not as bloody as fist of the north star i don't think i don't uh, remember i had probably seen it in a while mm, i don't but, know i can't yeah. say so how the bridge is warner brothers going to turn that into live action I know, yeah, right? I was, have you seen Akira? Yeah, I was gonna say uh, it's gonna be really difficult to make exactly. that live action. That'd be be a weird movie, but um, interesting enough, Fist of the North Star ended up being turned into a live action movie in in the nineteen nineties. I think it was oh, nineteen ninety six, I believe. So ten minutes, ten years after. 10 minutes. 10 years after the anime film. <laughs> I, I think I did that. Is that right? Did I write? Did I, did I look that up right? Because I looked, I looked it up and I was like, oh my god, it is just like I I have, I have should have watched it for the research, but I, I was like, oh man, because the live action movie looks like so, it was it's so corny and goofy. It is because they, they do a lot of prosthetic stuff too, so when he's when Kinshiro's punching people, you see their jaw going, <laughs> And it's like pointing this way, and it's like very pro cartoony in a way. You have like you have Clint Howard in the movie, in the live action movie, playing one of the gang members. Then uh, the guy who's playing Bat in the live action movie is Dante Bosco of all people. Dante oh, Bosco is in, Dante Bosco is in the live action Fist of the Sword is Bat. I mean, I was like, what, what, <laughs> what the fuck, Dante Bosco, really, man? Uh, <laughs> It's, 1995, um, I'm sorry, 1995. Yeah, okay, it was nine years, but whatever. Because I heard, just doing a little bit of research, that the movie is more representative of the manga than the TV series It was. is, it is. And I have a feeling I would like the TV series better just because I don't like the bloody... Yeah, like, I yeah. Cheat I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, it's it was, for a specific audience. Yeah, it is. And then, like I said, they had an advantage with this movie where they just stepped it up a notch and did all the blood and gore. If you watch the original like anime series that they were doing during the same time as the movie, I mean, you would probably get more story out of it. You get to see Kinshiro in his true form, and you get to see how things progress in the series as it goes on. I mean, I wasn't interested, interested in even watching the thing, too, because I was like, it's a great premise. I mean, it's... Kinshiro is a great character because it's interesting to see how he, you know, evolves as this character. Like, he knows all these moves. He's like, he punches, he kicks his, and he's like, you, you don't want to mess with them because you get one punch from him and your head explodes. Like, he's, he fights this big fat guy, 
and uh, he's just like right to the belly, and it was I don't feel anything. Oh, nice try, Ken. And all of a sudden, oh no, just explosions with the blood and everything. Wait a minute. Just. And there's a lot of swearing in this movie, too, mind you. It ain't a kid's movie. It's an adult movie. There's swearing in this dub, too, in the, in the English dub. There's, like, oh, son of a bitch, me. and there's, like, asswipe. <laughs> Fucking asswipe is being said in there. And just oh, like... yeah, that was... Yeah, that was pretty funny. I'm not gonna deny that. Like, the... <laughs> yeah, there's... This movie is, like... You know, I went from Kiki to being a Disney family-friendly anime from studio ghibli then you go to a motherfucking bloody gory as shit movie with I... fighting and explosions in the post apocalypse i'm just like jesus christ yeah I, I, like, I, left field. it is completely like for anime like it is completely left field off to the side because it's just yeah it's a it's a manly anime for those fans out there i mean goddamn um, yeah, I just, I freaking love it. Like, I want to see the live action movie now because even like, I think the, the, the male lead they got is also like a white guy. And of course this is in the nineties and people don't give a shit about whitewashing in the nineties. Yeah, I was going to say, this is the nineties. I was going to say how many people actually gave a shit about anime adaptations in the nineties. And that, that, that made me think about whitewashing in general because I just thought of, okay, people didn't care about a white actor playing a Japanese-ish character in an anime adaptation again, in the, the 90s. Internet wasn't, the internet wasn't a thing. And exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah, because yeah, uh, anime yeah. wasn't even popular in America until the 90s. Well, because, well, not, like, well, not even... I mean, like, the dubs. You don't have a place where people can complain much. Not even, like, social media didn't exist. Exactly. I was that... going to say, true. People didn't complain partially because... Yeah, the social media didn't exist, partially because anime didn't start becoming popular, like, dub-wise or being well-known until the 90s. With Pokemon, with Sailor Moon, with yeah. Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Power Rangers, in a weird way, is like a Japanese anime, only it's live-action. I'm yeah. sorry, but it's a Japanese show coming to America. It's almost, if they yeah. would have made this and started an anime, they would have fit in just fine. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just you could go at me, Power Rangers fans. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just interesting to think about these uh, adaptations of these uh, anime movies. I mean, Ghost in the Shell could have been something to you know explore upon, and of course, whitewashing is the issue. I mean, I, I, I swear to God, once I hear all the whitewashing news, I made a rant in the group with these guys, and I just blew up because I don't understand the whitewashing. I can understand, sure, it's. A adaptation. It, it, it depends. It's a it's a very sensitive subject. It is. It's I was very say, it's a, like it's a very yeah. debatable one. Yeah, because like, like if I may put a quick piece on it, like I can find an example of like when whitewashing is legitimate and when whitewashing seems just like complaining for nothing. Like for me, I understand the casting of Scarlett Johansson as Motoko in Ghost in the Shell, considering that they did change the script a little bit to make it more adaptable. For American audiences mm -hmm. to have a more American setting, right. that and also the fact that it's a robot, so of course it is possible that they could build robots to make them look like white or Asian or whatever. So mm -hmm. it's no real surprise that there would be white robots running around in the Ghost in the Shell universe. Mm -hmm. um, but when white watching is legitimate, it's something like uh, Gods of Egypt. You guys remember that movie last year? Uh, oh, yeah, wasn't that that? Yeah, yeah. That, like, that one had massive whitewashing controversies considering that you got a bunch of Egyptian gods. Most of them are played by white people. Okay. And, even the Egypt, and even the Egyptians themselves, like the stars, they are a bunch of white British, like a, a bunch of white people with a British accent. That's apparently how Egypt works. Yeah, yeah that, like, that's understandable. Like, I can understand like, with that. Like, 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 you have to like bend the rules a little bit to your own movie. Like uh, another example that, like, is pretty legit. Like, you know, it does make sense why they would do this. Why they would do that in terms of the casting is uh, the upcoming Death Note. Like, they changed that entire setup to be uh, set in the U in America, mm -hmm. where you have uh, you have a white actor and all that stuff because. 
you know, it's an American setting. And people are asking, like, oh, why don't they make it a Japanese actor? Why don't they set it in Japan? Well, if you really want a Japanese, if you want just a Japanese cast set in Japan and everything for a live action Death Note, that already exists. It's a Japanese movie. The only reason you're you're complaining about it is because that movie doesn't speak in English. Exactly. Exactly. I was gonna say, see, and there's already you... three, there's actually like I think a total of four live action Japanese Death Note movies, like the trilogy and an L spinoff. Well, yeah. See, here's the thing: people are complaining because this is Hollywood adapting Japanese manga. The for if you're Really, yeah, like, they're, they're, it's Japan, for God's sake. Yeah. This is, like, you're not going to please everybody. I mean, I know that it's Hollywood. We, unfortunately, have our own system. Mm -hmm. And Japan is completely different from us in a lot of ways. Yeah. Why do you I mean, I, I rather, yeah, and honestly, like, I'd rather have a good white actress playing an anime character instead of like a bad actor who's the what who's the right race portraying that same character you know yeah yeah, yeah I mean, it's everything exactly yeah you can't you can't it's kind of like what i've always been saying like you can't just have somebody there just because they're that race it, you have to have earned it like you have to already have a reputation for it and unfortunately with hollywood Di yes, there's diversity. I'm not going to deny that there's, there's major diversity, but it's not always easy to find the right casting for a movie specifically set for an anime. Like, that's anime. You can't find a lot of Japanese or, um, or like Japanese, Chinese, American actors or any. So it's just not as easy. Mm. So you kind of have to work with what you got, and I mean it's not a perfect. As long as the actor can play the character well, I don't see it as a problem. If you're gonna get upset about the whitewashing thing, and you're worried about why can't they just do it like in the anime, well, first of all, you can watch the actual anime. Second, you could find the live action Japanese versions. They probably already did for an anime already, because Japan's known for it. Japan is just as guilty of the live action shit as we are. I'm just saying. If you really feel like your America like Hollywood is wasting their time, I'm not gonna waste my money. Just go watch the Japanese dubs, please. Just Japanese I mean, sub movies, please. Watch it. I mean, you know what I mean. We're not forcing you to watch it. Yeah. Come on. I, I just I f see that's the thing about me. I just I feel like if you're gonna be complaining about american adaptation of a property that's foreign it's it, there's gonna be some tr some things you know different than the originals like, listen to the context. that's the important it's thing the context. Check the context first. yeah check the context first yeah check the context like not everything is going to be exactly adaptable based on book to add, book to movie or manga to movie or anime to movie it's it's not always possible. So you kind of have to work with what you got. And I know people are going to be like, the anime purists or the book purists, they're always going to be like, the book is better, the anime is better. Well, as long as it tries to get the spirit of the original, that's what I would care about more than the actual, whether it's completely accurate or not. Yeah, I mean... See, that's the thing, and I think a lot of people forget that. I mean, I've always been more open to different adaptations of books, movies, mm -hmm. mangas, whatever. Exactly. As long as it sticks true to the original, that I can care about it and I can actually get into it, great. But there's always going to be that bad adaptation, unfortunately, that exists. Hey, look, The Last Airbender. Hey, look, Dragon Ball Evolution. Hey, look. I pretty much named the two that everybody thinks of. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not gonna be the last. So. It's not gonna. It's not gonna stop. It's no, it's gonna happen. It's gonna. Yeah, they're gonna adapt something that's gonna be that true to the. I mean, uh, I was gonna say with the Fist of North Star live action movie, um, it went to straight to video, so it didn't go to the theater. So that's probably why not a lot of people have seen it. Um, probably why a lot of people never heard of it. M Malcolm McDowell's in this too as one of the bad guys. Um. 
But here's the thing I noticed between this one and the Ghost in the Shell remake as well, or adaptation, I should say. Um, the Japanese dub was provided by uh, the original people who did the 80s anime. Same thing with Ghost in the Shell. I've heard that the Japanese dub of the live-action movie is going to be voiced by the original voice cast of Ghost in the Shell. Yes. So, uh-huh. so, I mean, if you want to hear... I don't know. I mean, it's good. It'd probably be good to hear their dub if you know Japanese. I mean, so it's interesting. Oh. Interesting how they do that. I mean, I like that fact. Um, yeah, people just seem to be too nitpicky about their freaking adaptations. I mean, I'm more open minded about these people. It's all about performance, acting, not all about the right person to portray a character. I mean,. Yeah, I'm always oh, I've always been the believer. Like I know I read a lot of books, and I know there's movies that I really love that are not only very true to the books, but or whatever. I've seen a lot of movies like that, but there's always going to be that adaptation where you're like, oh, I didn't get it at all, and like, and I know a lot of people get mad about certain adaptations. So I mean, I'm not gonna get, like I understand why a lot of people hate the Last Airbender movie because. Trust me, it really sucks. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's just squeezing the first book when you the book is like 23 episodes of the original series, mind you. I was going to say, if you want to see the actual good story and characters, see the original see the original Nickelodeon series. And that's don't, a... don't waste your time. I mean, if you don't want to see a movie, don't go see it if it's... All based on what you think is. You see, you seen it once. Don't watch it again. Yeah. Or like, if your phone is bad, play it safe. Yeah. I just, yeah, a lot of people just like don't. You're not forced to go see it. Don't, don't, don't watch it then. It's fun. Um, no, that's a, that's the thing with adaptations in general. Like, uh, the live action, movie, even the anime movie, just they they try to do the first arc of the the man the manga Fist and Lore Star. So they try to cram so much into one movie which you know if they're gonna try to set up you know a storyline you gotta stick you know a television series that works very well because they set the storyline very well in a in episodic way so if you're doing a movie adaptation of an anime series or a manga which has a lot of chapters you know you gotta be careful what you're adapting into a movie and not just cram everything yeah, because, because like I say, you can't get everything that the book or the manga does, for the most part. Because there's always going to be elements that are specifically for a book. You can't always read. You can't always redo it in a movie. So you kind of have to mess with it in order to get it to work as a film. Film and book, film and manga, film and book are completely different things. So you kind of have to experiment a little bit. And I think, like, if you're going to... That's why, like, yeah, the Blast Era Bender movie failed because it was trying to do the show in t- an hour and a half. Like, the first season of the show in an hour and a half. That's just not possible. That's just too... that That's cramming way too much. But then you can have ones that probably don't work at all, like Dragon Ball Z, which they barely got the show, but I never watched it. I never watched Dragon Ball Z. And Which... It's just I'm like I know this from reading reviews. Yeah. I don't need to see the god. I know it the hard. I haven't seen Dragon Ball Z, but I have seen Dragon Ball Evolution, and my God, you don't have to watch the anime to know that it's bad. Yeah, like the thing I said, you don't have to watch the anime to know that the movie is terrible. Like it's yeah. Like you just gotta be careful with. I mean, I'm not. I mean, I'm not the world. I like Ghost in the Shell. Don't get me wrong. I haven't seen Innocence. I haven't seen any of the other sequels or anything right. like that. But I want to see the live action one. And I'm not really caring too much that Scarlett Johansson is the lead character. Yeah, from what I've heard from critic, from what I've heard from critics, they say that. It's mostly the story and the writing that sucks, but she did actually, from what I've heard, she did actually pull out a good performance and also, um, uh, what was this? Like, she did pull out a good performance and that the visuals are actually really good. So mm-hmm. basically a reverse Beauty and the Beast. 
You know what? <laughs> you know what, Matt? A good lead actress like... and good visuals? <laughs> I like to F walk in his bell. You... <sighs> yeah, Oddly enough, a... she's more robotic than Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> I mean, so... I mean... I mean Matt, <laughs> you always deserve this. Not the, not the best <laughs> audio animatronic that Disney crafted. <laughs> I live in a world of monkeys, and Matt is just the king of it. <laughs> oh. So, do you... I'm ready to go bananas. Do, do you think Hollywood should have a chance of adapting anime? Like, should they continue with this trend? Like, is it going to be horrible for people to be complaining about it, or should it just... Could you give Hollywood a chance to do, adapt anime into live action? Um, my answer is depends on the anime. Because, like, like yeah, I heard overheard about the Akira live-action movie they want to do. And, for me, having seen the original Akira movie, here's my question. How are they going to adapt it? Because it's a gory bloodfest. Like, that movie, I don't know how they could... It, like, the true purists who love Akira... Are probably going to be pissed off at Hollywood trying to do this movie if it doesn't get all the gore and the blood that the original anime did. I mean, how many times do you actually get, and especially with the rating system that we have, they would make this either rated R if they were going to really try to stay true. Oh, they're going or, to piss off so many people that they or they're going to. Yeah, because the, because they're in order to get a bigger audience, they're gonna put a PG thirteen and lower down the blood and gore content, which is gonna piss off a lot of main fans of the original. Yeah, so I mean that's the problem. And of <laughs> and of course they'll cast a white actor to play the main lead, and that's gonna piss people off. It's just like I just I feel like I feel like people should be watching more foreign films. Like they should watch the original like Japanese movie not just like the English dub just like watch the sub you know or just you know because I think Americans especially are not cultured enough to watch foreign films in their original context beyond the English dub because sometimes the English dub itself could might be a mistranslation of the original movie as well they might change a few words or change a few lines that is that in the original Japanese version so you gotta watch um, the original, you know, movie in the, in its context. I think that's pretty true for the most part because there are a lot of dubs that are terrible, and a lot of people will definitely agree oh, that yeah. there are certain animes that you just don't need to see the dub. Like, come on, Sailor Moon. Don't see the English dub. See the original. For God's sake, just see the original. Yes, it's over sixty, six like over six hundred episodes, but God damn it. You're gonna get more content from Sailor Moon, the original Japanese dub, than you are gonna get from the American dub. That hey, you know the ending? Hey, we had something weird shit that we edited in. Really? I mean, I don't know. Like, sir, but Disney, like Disney's known for making good dubs. Um, Cowboy Bebop is praised as a good dub. Mm -hmm. The English dub is definitely highly praised among fans. Like some people would actually i've heard some people praise the dub more than the original but that's depending on who you ask exactly so, again depends on who you ask whether they are a casual anime watcher or they are an otaku you will get completely different answers mm -hmm. whether you should watch the sub or whether you should watch the dub version for me i would say depends on the anime and depends on your preference do you want to watch the original sub version or do you want to find an English dub? Or are you so curious about this anime, if, even if they don't have a dub version, where you watch the sub version anyway? I just, I, that's that's the thing. That's the thing. People have to, you know, go out and actually do their research. Don't just assume just because you've seen a trailer for a goddamn movie and you're just like, like, oh my god, what was it? Actually, like this comparing animated or dub versus sub this is kind of like also 
watching a movie, and then if it's based off of a book, read the goddamn book. Yeah. I'm sorry, but you should re- like if you see a movie that is based on a book, and you are well aware of the book, and you like the movie, read the goddamn book. Just because you might be missing something from the original text that didn't get translated to screen. I mean, it's not that hard to educate yourself, people. I mean, it's just interesting that if you want to experiment with anime and you want to try something new, experiment with both dub and sub. Whatever anime you really like. Or if you are not, or if you are starting to dribble into anime, find which ones appeal to you and then experiment a little bit. You'll be amazed. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot to choose, and there's a lot to go for. So, that's there's, just my opinion. Yeah, there's a lot to go through, and uh, uh, that's about it. I mean, if you're into post-apocalyptic movies, blood and gore, the concept of Mad Max in an anime form, uh, the English dub's not so bad. I mean, Ken, the guy who voices Ken is just. I mean, he's okay. I mean, if you want to watch the Fist of the North Star, watch the original anime series, the television series, because it has a lot more development when it comes to story and character more than the movie. Um, so, um, yeah. If you want me, if you want us to do more anime, uh, leave a comment below, because you never know. We might revisit this topic in the future. Because, you know, visiting uh, different animated movies from different countries is usually interesting. Um, next time on the podcast, we are going to do a little bit different concept here. We've talked about directors a little bit in the past, more or less, I think. or did, I don't think we have done a director episode, but we are going to focus on um, underrated directors. So we're, we're all... The, pick a director we're going to talk about their film work and why they are underrated in the world of hollywood or even other countries if you pick a, a foreign director because there's a lot of directors that don't get a lot of uh, love out there and they need to be talked about so this has been cinema royale thanks for watching please give this a like and pass this along to all your friends if you do enjoy this and uh goodbye Oh. All right, see you later, folks, and enjoy some anime. Anime. <laughs>